So my name is Ismail Dwiri. I'm general manager of Atijari Wafa Bank, which is a financial institution present in 25 countries with total assets of 65 billion US dollars, total equity of 6.3 billion dollars. Uh, it is listed in Casablanca with a market cap of 11.9 billion US dollars. And uh, the story of the relationship with Sopra Banking is very old with a number of, uh, of products, but it, it intensified significantly uh, when uh, Sopra bought uh, Delta. Why? Because uh, as soon as we started expanding outside of Morocco, uh, and this was in 2004, we made a decision to have only one core banking system outside of Morocco in order to capture economies of scale, in order to capture know-how, have the same team managing uh, the solution, etc. And at that time, we selected uh, Delta and then later it was uh, bought by Sopra Banking and today the name is, uh, as you probably know, Amplitude. And so we stuck with this decision until now and uh, I think we now have 25 implementations, 18 of which are in the latest version, which is uh, Amplitude Up. And I think we are now the largest customer of Sopra Banking for this product. Um, I was uh, asked to uh, 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 say a word during the acquisition by Sopra of uh, Delta a few years ago. And at that time we were second. And I told you that uh, we have a common point with uh, Sopra, which is that we always want to be a leader. So I'm happy to say that today we are the number one customer of Sopra Banking for this product. Well, the main challenge is the cost of service because we are uh, talking about a segment of uh, customers that is very price sensitive, that doesn't generate uh, a large revenue per client. Uh, in fact, a revenue per client that is significantly lower than the average of clients that we are serving, at least for retail. So costs uh, in our business are increasingly related to technology more than human resources and so far the way we deliver uh, those services are largely based on fixed costs so either uh, we serve markets that are large enough to capture economies of scale or we have to turn these costs into variable costs through cloud-based infrastructure and software or through innovative partnerships, but also through innovative billing schemes. The fintechs are, are already playing a, a very large role uh, today, so we don't have to wait uh, the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, they focus on customer experience, they force incumbents that are uh, usually banks to accelerate their digital transformation if they want to protect their existing business. Uh, but it's also important to stress that uh, uh, from the perspective of regulators, it is important to create the right level playing field. Uh, but also for capital markets, it is important to avoid creating bubbles that will destroy value for society in general. And I'll explain why. Financial services are regulated for good reasons. They, regulators impose a lot of rules uh, that are meant to protect customers and their assets, to create transparency on the conditions and fees that are related to the service being offered. And uh, retail banking relies heavily on cross subsidies between products and between clients and segments. So allowing uh, attackers to unbundle those cross subsidies, uh, of course, can be an interesting incentive to force incumbents to improve their offering. But they are also a big risk that the whole 
uh, cross-subsidy that allows banks to invest in physical infrastructure. And we, we said how important physical infrastructure will remain, but also to invest on compliance and to invest on IT and those fixed costs that we already addressed is also very important. So attacks by unregulated fintechs based on free offering of services in order to acquire scale while accepting recurring losses financed by money collected through capital markets at sky high valuations that are impossible to explain financially is frankly incompatible with disciplined investment uh, and can threaten a whole area of financial services not only uh, low income banking and financial inclusion but the rest of businesses it's it can be a matter of financial stability in the end so my, my vision is a disciplined competition with clear rules that don't allow cherry picking and more importantly better financial discipline by investors who are again we see it these days investing in fintechs without knowing what the end game is for the industry and so they may create a much larger uh, negative impact than what they think they are doing it because they're supporting innovation and that is good but if the end game is creating financial instability and slowing down financial inclusion because nobody will invest in order to reach uh, unprofitable customers today i think that's uh, an issue so the ideal model would be one where each player is able to put their strengths at work and extract their fair share from the generated revenue. Well, I think first we have to acknowledge that KYC and compliance in general is an area where uh, we make no compromise. And in fact, no compromise is possible. It's not only because it's a it's mandatory, it's also because our business is based on trust. And so those rules are meant to uh, keep trust uh, there and uh, protect uh, our, our business. So despite, I would say, the growing demands that uh, require uh, an allocation of an increasing share of our resources to compliance, it is really very high on our agenda. And so far, I would say because financial inclusion is also a top priority for regulators, uh, we found them very receptive to ideas that allow compliance without creating uh, unnecessary burden on uh, customers in terms of cost of service or in terms of customer experience.